Yeah, so the title of my talk is then Computational Design of Molecular Photo Switches. So I am a theoretical chemist, so I do, I do chemistry by computers. So I design molecules, I study their reactions and properties using, using essentially quantum mechanics. And then through collaborations then with experimentalists, uh, uh, hopefully some of our findings can be realized. And in particular, I'm interested in, uh, in photochemistry. So, so, so chemi chemistry induced by light, essentially. And the outline for my talk is the following. So first I talk about molecular switches, what they are and uh, their key characteristics and what they can do. And in particular, I talk about molecular photo switches. So molecular photo switches are then switches whose reactions then are driven by light, as the name suggests. And I talk about molecular photo switches for storage of solar energy. And then I talk a little bit about molecular motors, what they are. Molecular motors are a type of molecular switches with some uh, added functionality. And then I come then to, to, the, to the main, to the main uh, part of my presentation, where, where, where I describe research that we have performed, where we have tried then to, to uh, improve the chemical reactions that, that govern both molecular motors and molecular switches by using the concept of aromaticity in excited states. So of course, aromaticity in ground states is a very well-known concept, but in recent years, this concept has also been, has been uh, introduced to, for uh, basically design of uh, photochemical reactions. So that's, that's what I describe. Okay, so molecular switches, what are, what are molecular switches? Well, molecular, so they are molecular systems and they typically have two stable forms, A, and B. So, so A and B are different isomers of a molecular system. So they are connected then by an isomerization reaction. And then you trigger this isomerization reaction by some external stimulus, lambda. So this external stimulus can be light, it can be temperature, it can be pH, it can be electric or magnetic fields. So therefore you can, in, you can then interconvert A and B back and forth by application of this st stimulus. And this then is if some key property changes between A and B, because then you can control this key property. And then for molecular photo switches, so that so molecular photo switches are then switches where this external stimulus is light and they have some desirable, they have some desirable features. Of course, you want fast response times. So you would like to be able to interconvert between A and B quickly. And you want high quantum yields in both directions. So you, for every photon that the system absorbs, you would like to trigger a reaction. And you want A and B to be readily detectable. You should be able to detect in which state the system is A or B. And you want fatigue resistance. That means you would like to be able to cycle back and forth between A and B many, many times without any degradation of the, mole of the molecules. And then you want that these key, key photochemical properties of A and B, you want them to be kept also when these molecules are incorporated into a device, okay? And ideally you also want, you also want the molecules to be responsible to visible light rather because of course visible light is less harmful and energetic. So it tends not to degrade the molecules to the extent that UV light will. Okay. And as I said, this is then useful if some key property changes between A and B. So for example, if the capacity to form hydrogen, hydrogen bonds changes between A and B, you may then have a switch for self-assembly. If the capacity to transport electron changes between A and B, then you may instead have a switch for molecular electronics. So for example, here you have one isomer and here the conjugation is broken. You have two single bonds, while here it is fully conjugated. So therefore you expect this isomer to conduct, uh, to, to be able to transport electrons to be much better than this isomer. 
Okay. And here are just some examples of molecular, different types of molecular photoswitches and, and the governing reaction. So often this isomerization reaction is an E, e cis trans photoisomerization reaction. So you have a rotation around a double bond. And for example, in steel beans, atzobenzines or chiral optical switches. And you may also have a photocyclization reaction. And these are then full guides, spiropyranes, detunylatines, or you may also have a, a hydrogen atom or proton transfer reactions in salicylidine anilines or oxazolidine switches. So different types of, uh, of molecular photoswitches. And then there are also, what I'm particularly interested in is then molecular photoswitches for storage of solar energy. Because it's clear that uh, a, success, a successful transition from an energy production based on fossil fuels uh, to renewable energy. But of course, the solar, both solar influx and energy demand vary uh, with respect to the time uh, of the day, the weather and the season. So that means that technologies are needed for storage and subsequent, subsequently releasing uh, solar energy. And one popular approach for this is storage in the form of thermal energy. For, so this is very straightforward. I mean, you just have water and then you let uh, su sunlight heat the water and then you try to, 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 to keep the water heated. Or you can store it in phase change materials. Okay, but an, an alternative approach, an alternative approach is to store it then in chemical bonds. And this has a big advantage over storage in thermal energy with respect to the long-term availability of the energy. And for this, you can use artificial photosynthetic systems, or you can use molecular photoswitches, for example. And these molecular photoswitches are typically called molecular solar thermal energy systems. Okay, and then the basic mechanism for this is more or less the following. So you have the two isomers of the molecular photoswitch, isomer one and isomer two. And isomer one is the parent form, the more stable form. And this isomer then absorbs light, which produces isomer one in the excited state. And then the excited, this molecule in the excited state then forms isomer two, okay? And this isomer, isomer two, uh, has a much higher energy, but despite this, it's stable. So the barrier, the barrier for thermal, for the thermal back reaction from isomer two to isomer one is high, despite the fact that uh, it's much uh, less stable than isomer one. So that means that if this barrier is high, uh, you can store this you can store the solar energy in terms of this difference in chemical energy for a long time. And then by adding a catalyst, you can reduce this barrier and therefore you can release the solar energy as heat. So whenever you want to release the energy, you add the catalyst and then you get back this stored energy as heat. And here is just a, a tentative domestic implement, implementation of this concept. And, and, and so this is this system then is fully circular. So there's no exhaust, exhaustion or polluting gases and no to toxic byproducts. So, it, so this is the good, uh, some good uh, features of this system. And then some desirable properties that you want. You, of course, you want that isomer one then. You want that isomer one has a large absorption overlap with the most intense band in the solar spectrum, which is around 500 nanometers. Uh, you want a high quantum yield, of course, for the photoisomerization of isomer one into isomer two. And you want a large storage energy. And then you want the molecule to have a low weight. So that means that large storage energy and a low weight means then high energy storage density. And as I said, you want this barrier to be large meaning that you can store the energy for a long time, be it hours, days, or months. But at the same time, you want the, this thermal back reaction to be catalytically inducible. So that means that you are able then to lower this barrier significantly by adding a catalyst. 
which means that you can you can release the energy promptly. And of course, you want high fatigue resistance. So that means you can go back and forth between the isomers many times. Okay, so that then sets the stage for, for our work on molecular photoswitches. Here are then just some examples of different photoswitches that do this, that store solar energy. Norbornadienes, azobenzenes, dihydroazolines, and also organometallic deuterium compounds. Okay, and now I will also want to set the stage for our work on molecular motors. So I, just a brief introduction also to molecular motors. So molecular motors are also molecular switches. They also switch between different isomers, but they have also the added uh, capacity to perform work. They are able to perform mechanical work by absorbing energy and converting this energy into mechanical motion non-random directed mechanical motion, and they can do this in a controllable fashion. And if the motion that is produced is rotation, these motors are called rotary molecular motors. If it's translation, they are called linear molecular motors. And here are just some examples of uh, synthetically, synthetic molecular motors that have, have been produced in the laboratory, catenanes, consisting of interlocked rings, rotaxanes, consisting of a ring mounted on a rod, and chiral overcrowded alkenes. And these are then the type of molecular motors that the 2016 Nobel Prize winners in chemistry developed. So the key characteristic then of a rotary molecular motor, so I will exclusively focus on rotary molecular motors that produce rotation, is then that they are able to rotate a full 360 degrees, typically around the chemical bond. They're able to control the direction of the rotation, clockwise or counterclockwise, and they are able to repeat the rotation continuously through consumption of the energy that, that you provide. And as you probably know, rotary molecular motors, they occur naturally at the level of complex protein assemblies. So for example, for generation of ATP, all organisms use uh, a, a, a protein complex called ATP synthase, which essentially functions as a molecular motor, and also for the generation of biomechanical forces, all organisms use protein complexes called myosins for this, and also for intramolecular transport systems. But then the problem is, or the challenge, I should say, is then to be able to synthesize molecular motors that are as efficiently as the molecular motors that nature have, uh, have produced through evolution. Okay. And then what, so what can then synthetic molecular motors do? Well, this is just, uh, just an example. This is just an example. So they can propel nanocars. So this is then, uh, this is a nanocar. And then you can see, so this of course is just, uh, this is just, uh, 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 simulation, but what, what the molecular motors can do is then that they can produce, they can transform this rotary motion into translation. So here you have a nanocore and each wheel here is a molecular motor. And that means that you can then transport molecular cargo. So, so whatever molecules you would like to transport in a controllable fashion, you attach, you attach these molecules to this nanocore. This is another nanocar designed by uh, James Tour. And then a proposed future applications is to use then molecular motors to, 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 to propel drug delivery vehicles in the body. So you would like to be able to transport uh, pharmaceuticals in the body in a controlled way. And then you encapsulate these drugs into vehicles. And these vehicles are then, are then powered by molecular motors. Or you would like to use molecular motors to inject drugs into cells in a controlled way. And then you can use molecular motors to drill holes in cell membranes through which drugs can be delivered. And I mean, th and this is for real. I mean, th this, this has actually, this concept has been, has been, uh, has, has proven its potential. Okay. And then, so I said that the most, the most, uh, 
Currently, the most advanced form of synthetic molecular motors are the light-driven molecular motors, the chiral overcrowded alkenes, developed by Nobel Prize winner Ben Feringa. And they are shown here. So they have a rotary cycle that essentially then goes through four different steps. And they, in these steps, you have two photoisomerization reactions, one here and one here. So the molecule absorbs light and rotates around this double bond. And the key then to these molecular motors that they are able to function is that this photoisomerization and this photoisomerization, they occur in the same direction. So if this rotation here occurs in a clockwise fashion, this rotation here also occurs in a clockwise fashion. So that means that through two consecutive photoisomerizations, these motors produce a full 360 degrees rotation. And in order then to do this, in order to do this, these, there are also intermediary thermal steps needed, okay? So you also need thermal steps. And then uh, the rotational frequencies of the first molecular motors of this kind they were then severely restricted by the barriers of the intermediary thermal steps, okay? But this problem has now been, been solved. And uh, I think uh, my research group has, has contributed a little bit to this. But nowadays, the biggest challenge is instead that these photoisomerization reactions, these photoisomerization reactions, they have very, very low quantum yields, okay? So that uh, rarely more than 10%. So that means that of the energy that so the of the energy that is absorbed by the motors, not much of this energy is is produced is converted into rotary motion. Okay, so that's the big problem. So the the motors need to be able to exploit the energy much much more efficiently, and the reason for this then the reason for this has also been has also been understood, and the reason is that this double bond. Around which, around which these photoisomerizations occur. Of course, what happens when the photoisomerization occurs, this double bond in the excited state becomes a single bond. That's why it's easier to rotate in the, in the excited state. And of course, this is the key feature for all cis-trans photoisomerization reactions. You have a double bond. In the ground state, it cannot rotate around the double bond. But then in the excited state, it becomes a single bond, and then the photoisomerization becomes much more easy. And the reason why the quantum yields then for the photoisomerizations are so low is that this double bond in the excited state, it tends to cleave homolytically, okay? It tends to cleave homolytically. And this has some bad cons consequences. So it, it tends to cleave homolytically, and therefore this rotary motion is not very efficient. And therefore, one instead would like this bond to cleave heterolytically in the excited state, okay? And then we thought that one, one possible solution to this is that one can make the bond cleave heterolytically in the excited state if this heterolytic bond cleavage is connected to the formation of an aromatic excited state, okay? Because an aromatic aromaticity is always something favorable. And if you have a, a motor, and by cleaving the bond heterolytically, it can gain some stability by becoming aromatic, then it would like to cleave heterolytically. Okay, and here then is our sim very simple motor design shown here. So here in this motor, we have a cyclopentadiene moiety. We have a cyclopentadiene moiety. And cyclopentadiene is a textbook example of a molecule which is not aromatic. And then you also have a methyl pyrrolidine moiety here. And the methyl pyrrolidine moiety has electron donating capacity. And then we perform quantum chemical calculations. And then we could show that in the bright S2 state of this motor, this cyclopentadiene is transformed into an aromatic cyclopentadienyl anion, which is then aromatic. And this then promotes this bond to cleave heterolytically because you, then it, you gain something through the formation of an aromatic moiety here. 
And therefore we would expect this molecular motor to be able to rotate very efficiently around this double bond. Okay. And then we considered two different systems. Here is our motor. And here we have a reference system. And in the reference system, uh, we have replaced the cyclopentadiene. We have replaced the cyclopentadiene uh, with uh, cyclopentene, okay? And cyclopentene cannot become aromatic in the excited state because it only has one double bond. So this is then our reference system. And how do we then model this? So then instead of doing Instead of doing experiments, we do, as I said, computer simulations. And in particular, we do uh, non-adiabatic molecular dynamics simulations. And then we use something uh, which is called the Thales fuel switches algorithm, which essentially then combines a quantum mechanical description of the electrons with a classical description of the nuclei. And in order to investigate dynamics, we calculate forces and we calculate uh, nuclear forces using ab initio quantum chemistry. And then we solve Newton's equations for the nuclei and then the Schrodinger equation for the electrons. And we use a relatively, relatively good uh, quantum, chemical, uh, quantum chemical level of theory. We calculate then many trajectories because we cannot just calculate one trajectory because we would like to simulate the quantum mechanical uncertainty uh, of, 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 of molecules. And we run the simulations for around 800 femtoseconds. And this is what we find. So here is our motor design, the one we think is good with the aromatic, with the capacity then to form an aromatic moiety. And we, and we simulate the photoisomerization by starting the simulation in the bright excited state. Okay, and this is in black here. Here we start the trajectories. And in blue is then where the trajectory decays to the ground state. And in red is where the trajectory has completed the photoisomerization. Okay, and then we do this. And then what we see for this good molecular system here, in red are the quantum yields. So the quantum yields that we calculate are very high, 75, around 75%. And here we have excited state lifetimes and photoisomerization times, and they are short. So this molecule is able to photoisomerize within 300 femtoseconds, roughly. And here we have the results then for, for the reference system. And then we can see that the quantum yields are much lower and the, and the photoisomerization times are, are longer, okay? So th th this, I believe, shows then that this, well, this clearly shows that this motor is, is, is performing better than this motor, okay? So it isomerize, isomerizes both more quickly and more efficiently. And here is, just, here is just an illustration from the simulation then. This is a movie from the simulations. And if you see the, if you look at this here, so here are then two trajectories merged together of the two photoisomerizations. Oops. And hopefully you can see that this molecule is then rotating around the central double bond. And it's rotating in one and the same direction. So it's a, two unidirectional rotations. Okay, and then one can ask oneself, so is it really, does this moiety, does it really become aromatic? And then one can calculate various aromaticity indices for this cyclopentadiene motif. One can calculate, one index is called the Shannon aromaticity index, which is an electronic index. So it basically measures the variation in electro electronic density between bond critical points. And then for an aromatic system, one expects this variation to be small. And then one can also calculate a geometric index because in an, an aromatic system, you expect all carbon-carbon bond lengths to be more or less equal. And then one can calculate this HOMA index, harmonic oscillator model of aromaticity. Okay. And for HOMA, if it's aromatic, the values should be around one. If it's not aromatic, it should be around zero. 
and here we start then we start then in the excited state here are the homa we start in the ground state and then in the excited state you can see the homa value increases the homa is in black here so it this increases so it really becomes aromatic in the excited state while this this Shannon aromaticity index it decreases as it should if it's aromatic okay so this these plots then really show that it really shows that this cyclopentadiene motif becomes aromatic in the excited state the bonds the bond length becomes much more similar and the variation in electron density becomes smaller and then we did I tested also other molecules because in the previous molecule, I said we had an electron donating molecule. You need electron donating capacity in this part of the molecule in order to transform this into an aromatic cyclopentadienyl anion. And then we could also show that even, so we first we tested with a strong electron donating group, amino, with a weak electron donating group, methyl, and no electron donating capacity, hydrogen, or even electron withdrawing group. Nitro, a nitro group. And then we could clearly show then in, in simulations that these two systems with electron donating capacity perform much better than these system. So this is another indication then that it's really forming an aromatic system. And here are then, here are the, these results. Or this is then for metal group, uh, sorry, amino group, metal group, hydrogen, and nitro. And then with, with the electron donating capacity in these two molecules, we can see that the HOMA values go toward one. So it really becomes aromatic, while this does not happen without the electron donating groups. Here it does not approach one. Same result in for with this Shannon aromaticity indices that with the electron donating capacity, the variation in electron density goes down, as you would expect in an aromatic system. And then one can also one can also calculate other measures like magnetic measures to probe the aromaticity, like, like these Nix indices. But basically, the conclusion is that the onset of aromaticity in the excited state is then a useful concept for the development of better performing light-driven molecular motors. That's our conclusion. So here we have. We can improve a photochemical reaction by the onset of aromaticity in the excited state. And then we ask ourselves, can we also do the opposite? Can we also do the opposite? So can we, can we facilitate a photochemical reaction by the loss of aromaticity in the excited state? Okay. And then the inspiration for this part of the work is a previous computational study by a Mexican group who started then salicylidine aniline photoswitches, which go from an enol isomer to a keto isomer, or from enol to keto. And in the enol form, you have a phenol group, phenol group, phenol moiety here. And in the keto form, you have a cyclohexadienon moiety. And of course, that means that going from here to here thermally, if you go from aromatic to non-aromatic, this is not going to be very favorable in the thermal process. So that means that uh, it's an unfavorable process shown here. You go up in energy, but it's a very, very favorable process photochemically in the excited state. So in the excited state, the process is downhill. Okay. And then the question is, why is this process so much more favorable in the excited state? And what these researchers then predicted is that while in the ground state, you have a gradual loss, you have a gradual loss of aromaticity, okay? But in the excited state, in the excited state, all the aromaticity that is lost when you go from here to here is lost, is lost immediately when the molecule absorbs light, okay? So it lost immediately here. And if it loses all the aromaticity in this step, there is no more aromaticity to lose, okay? And therefore the subsequent process is very favorable, okay? And then we asked ourselves, can we use this then to exploit? Can we use this principle 
to design a molecular photo switch, which would then be useful for these MOST applications that I talked about earlier for the storage of solar energy. So then we tried to design a D-theonyl benzene switch where you have three aromatic moieties to begin with, thiophene, thiophene, and benzene. And then you convert this in a photocyclization reaction to this molecule. And here we have no aromatic moieties anymore. No aromatic moieties. So that means, of course, that this isomer uh, lies much higher in energy than this isomer. So that, that would then suggest that with this chemical reaction, you could store a lot of, you could store a lot of solar energy. And this also suggests then that the barrier should be high because going from non-aromatic to aromatic, uh, it, it, could be, it could be then that the barrier is high. Okay. And then we also wondered, uh, can this also lead to high quantum yield? And then we decided to investigate this both computationally and in collaboration with uh, organic synthetic chemists who, who tested this idea experimentally. And then what we could find is by doing these calculations, we found then that yes, this switch stores a lot of energy and the barrier is quite high, okay? And this was also confirmed experimentally. And what we also could, could see is that the photochemical reaction is very favorable. It's a completely downhill process. So this photochemical reaction is favorable. And we also did the molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, and what we could see from the dynamic simulations that yes, this photoisomerization reaction is really, really favorable. Again, we do, we do a combination of uh, classical mechanics for the nuclei and quantum mechanics for the electrons. And what we could see that in more or less half of the trajectories, this chemical reaction occurs within 200 femtoseconds. Okay. And finally, what we were also able to demonstrate that it's really because this loss of aromaticity in the initial step. So in the initial step, this part of the molecule is initially is aromatic. And then when it absorbs light, it loses all this aromaticity to become anti-aromatic. Okay. And when it has lost all this aromaticity, it's even anti-aromatic. And then any subsequent chemical reaction will be easy, will proceed easily. So therefore, our conclusion then is that the loss of aromaticity in the excited state can then be a useful concept for the development of more efficient MOST systems. So we are very happy with this paper. We published this in, in, in JAX uh, last year. So basically what I think I have well, what I have tried to show is then how one can use this aromaticity concept to design efficient photochemical reactions. Okay, and that's actually all I wanted to say. So here are my acknowledgements. So, uh, so much of this work, uh, or all of this work, I should say, was done in collaboration with my former PhD student, Basvant Uruganti. Uh, and he was a, my former PhD student and now collaborator, and Jun Wang, okay? And Baswant, he was uh, at Kitam University for a while, and then he actually then had a student, a local student, Varada Bargav, who, who contributed to this project. And here are the people who, who have been involved, Michael Kaufman, Alessandro Biancardi, and Enrique Arpa. But in particular, I would like to highlight the contribution by Baswant and Jun and Varada. So they made this work uh, possible. Organic synthesis, so an experimental characterization, Gabor London and Peter Paul Klapos. So they show that these molecules that we have been designing computationally, that they actually can be synthesized and that they work as we hope they will. And some funding from some various resources. And thank you, the organizers for the invitation and everybody who has listened. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.